presentation is a little unique because sometimes people come to a prophecy program like this and they're thinking, you know, I just want to know when is the end coming? How is it going to unfold? What do the prophecies teach? And, and where do I run and hide so that I can survive? But really, at the core of all Bible prophecy, it's talking about a person, and it's talking about how you can be saved eternally, not just live a little longer in this life. You know, I want to open to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, in the vision there, the Apostle John says, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and on the of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Here in this vision, it talks about a throne where you'd expect to see a king seated, but it's got a slain lamb. Now this is really an elementary Bible symbol. On the throne there is Jesus. He is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And it's slain. This is a bleeding lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but blood is not, for me, a pleasant subject. Uh, my wife is a physical therapist, and she's worked in hospitals, and it doesn't bother her. But it uh, makes me a little squeamish. And uh, I think that's a natural reaction. Even children, the first time they start bleeding, uh, they, there's a, sometimes a look of panic on their face like, oh, no, I'm leaking. Now what? You know, what's going to happen? And it just seems so unnatural. But, you know, the Bible tells us that life is in the blood. That's Leviticus 17, verse 11. Even back then, they recognized every cell in your body is both nourished and cleansed. It receives its oxygen, and the bad gases are removed through the circulation system by blood. The life is in the blood. And the Bible tells us that God has made of one blood all people, meaning we're all related. And even DNA experts have tracked all people on the planet back to common ancestors. Even National Geographic agrees with that. Newsweek had a magazine that said there must have been an Eve because all the DNA of humans is common. And it's also true that everybody who is going to be in the kingdom is going to be there by virtue of the blood of one man. It's a blood transfusion of the Lamb of God that saves everybody. You know, during the bubonic plague, they, they discovered that, well, they didn't know it then, but they discovered afterward, the only cure for the bubonic plague is to get a transfusion from somebody who was exposed but developed a resistance. And according to the Bible, the only person who has come into this world and lived a perfect life is Jesus. And the only cure for the problem of sin is a transfusion of his blood. Now, as we're talking about the subject of prophecy, be honest. Would some of you like to know who is the beast and what is the mark of the beast in 666? What does that all mean? Come on, wouldn't you like to know that? The Bible talks about Babylon, the fall of Babylon. If you read in Revelation chapter 14, it's got three angels. It starts at verse 6, and it talks about the beast, and it talks about those who worship the beast, and it talks about Babylon. But you know what it says just before that? It says, I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. You can't really explain these apocalyptic symbols outside of the context of the everlasting gospel. In other words, I cannot, as much as you might want me to, separate these prophetic teachings from the way the Bible wraps them around Jesus. All of these teachings are wrapped around something called redemption. And so if I tell you the whole truth about prophecy and you understand it perfectly, if you don't know Jesus, will it do you any good? Not according to prophecy. Well, back to the question and answer format. I want to make sure I cover all my points. This is as much for my benefit as yours. Question number one. Does God really care about me personally? Yes. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, how many of you would admit that there are times when you've wondered if God loves you? Does he really care? 
Have your children ever wondered if you love them? I've told you that we have five children. We had six children. And our oldest son, Micah, when he was born, beautiful baby boy. Big blue eyes, curly blonde hair, and just was a delightful little boy. When he was about 19 months old, he was very lethargic in his crib, and we got worried. Took him to the emergency room of the local hospital, and after a brief examination, the doctor said, he may have spinal meningitis. But the only way to be sure is to do a test, a spinal tap. And they do this while you're awake. And they take a long needle. They have to insert it between the vertebrae and the spine, extract spinal fluid, and test it. Well, our little boy is just he's walking around a little bit. He says mommy and daddy and banana and doesn't really understand what's going on, but he just knows he doesn't feel good. And so they take him in the room. Mom excused herself. She said, I can't watch this. And so I stayed in there with him as the doctors and nurses held him. And the doctor was an intern. And he had not done this very often. And it absolutely broke my heart as I had to watch him two or three times push the needle into the back, trying to find the right spot. And Micah is awake. And he's looking at me. And he's crying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And he couldn't understand, why would I let them do this to him? And don't you know that broke my heart? He thought, Dad doesn't love me. Oh, nothing could have been further from the truth. I would have traded places with him in an instant. Turns out he did have spinal meningitis. And he recovered from that. But, uh, you know, it just broke my heart to think that there was a time when he wondered, don't you love me? Why are you letting them hurt me? If you think your children should trust you love them, how much more should you trust that God loves you? He's a much better parent than I am and than you are. Isn't that right? He loves you, no doubt about it. How has God demonstrated his love for us? You know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's one of the most famous verses in the world. It's a powerful verse. That's why people quote it. It sort of encapsulates the greatness of the gospel. He so loved the world, yes, but he so loved you individually. He loves you so much, I'd venture to say, that if you were the only human on the planet that had sinned, he would have come down and gone through everything that he went through just for you. And if he has enough power to save the world from its sins, do you think he has enough to save you? How do I receive him and pass from death unto life? How does this happen? Again, I want to stop and I want to remind you why this is so important. Do you want to understand what's happening? Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If you are God and you're going to reveal the truth about the future to people on the planet, would you reveal it to the ones that are surrendered to you or the ones who are still in rebellion? What I'm giving you tonight in this presentation of the basics of the gospel is the key to unlock the future. Because when you do surrender to the Lord, you hear him differently. Even Jesus, after he was baptized, it says the heavens were opened and he heard a voice. When Isaiah saw the Lord and he surrendered to the Lord, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, you'll hear differently. God will speak to your heart like he never has before. All of a sudden, the frequency, you ever go through the radio, it's just static, you don't understand, but if you dial it in right, oh, it gets very clear. And when you surrender your heart to God, all of a sudden, it starts to get clear. And even when you read his word, it suddenly gets translated and it makes a lot more sense. So how do I receive him and pass from death to life? Well, first of all, recognize that you're a sinner. All have sinned. Every person who's ever been born is born with a selfish nature, and we've all sinned. And uh, you're not alone. We're all infected with this terminal disease called sin. It says, we've all turned everyone to his own way, in Isaiah 53, verse 6. Sin makes us selfish. Most people make their decisions from day to day based on, what's in it for me? What will this mean to me? 
We're naturally very selfish. It's a supernatural miracle when God gives us new hearts and we start being motivated by love. Many of us have no idea what that means until the Spirit of God comes into your life. It's very real, friends. That's what the Bible teaches. We've all turned everyone to his own way. And the penalty for sin is death. Now, I know this sounds pretty serious, and it is. Why is that? If God loves us, then why is the penalty for sin death? You're living on an island in the South Pacific, beautiful island. You're very happy. It's a paradise. And you and your spouse have 10 children. We're still assuming you can be happy with 10 children. But then one of your children becomes infected, small island, with a deadly, painful disease, and it's contagious. Now, you've got to make a choice. You've got to put that child on a raft and push it out to sea or let it stay on the island and all of the children will die. What are you going to do? That's a terrible dilemma to be faced with. But this is sort of what God's faced with, with this planet has a disease. And God's got other angels and creations out there in the cosmos, but we're sort of quarantined right now because of sin. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. The reason he could die for our sins is he came to earth as a human. As our example, he lived a perfect life. He showed us what the Father's like, and then he traded places with us. At the cross, Jesus was taking what we deserve. He's giving us what he deserves. He gives us his strength and his holiness and his peace, and he took our misery and our separation, our pain, our punishment. And when you accept that by faith, it becomes real. That's why so often when someone came to Jesus and they were healed, he said, your faith has made you whole. God's given you all the power of faith. You can choose to believe, and then it happens. Or you can choose to go through your life as a doubter and a skeptic, and you'll have just what you believe. All things are possible if you believe. I was in the Philippines a couple of years ago, and uh, I went to a prison there, 10,000 inmates. And I, after going there, I heard a story about these two brothers. One converted, became a Christian, and the, his twin brother, identical twins, he didn't convert to Christianity because his wife was against it. And his life started to spiral downhill. He drove a jipney, a taxi there, and, and had a wife and several children. His Christian brother, he never did get married. And, and uh, the jipney driver, twin, had an accident while drinking, killed a mother and two of her children. He was tried for manslaughter, put in prison for 30 years. And now his wife and children had no father. His brother went to prison to visit him. And after spending some time with him, he said, look, I know the Lord. I've got eternal life. I could stay here in prison and work for Jesus and minister to these people here. Your family needs you. Take my pass. Take my clothes. The guards will never know the difference. Go to your family. And his brother, after just a little urging, accepted it. And you know what? Because of the love of the Christian brother, it broke his heart. He accepted Christ. And he went out to his family and had freedom because of the sacrifice that his brother made. Jesus hasn't done less, less for you. He is the just who has traded places with us, the unjust. What must I do in order to obtain this gift of salvation? Answer, Matthew 7, 7. Jesus said, ask, and you'll receive. He also says we need to be aware that we got a problem, and he has the answer. That's called repentance. Repentance means being sorry for our sins and having a willingness to turn away from them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? You read that up there? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do our part and tell God that we're sorry, if we ask Jesus for his forgiveness and we confess that we're sinners, he promises us, unless you think God's a liar, that he'll forgive us. And not only that, he cleanses our record from all the unrighteousness of your life. He looks upon you as though you have never sinned before. Oh, I don't know what that does for you, friends, but I had a pretty big record racked up even by the time I was 17 when I came to Jesus. I mean, it meant a lot to me to have a new beginning. When I join his family through faith, what change does Jesus make in my life? 
You can read about this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, when you receive the Lord, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he says he'll give you his spirit, even the spirit of truth. You know him, that spirit of truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the truth. That's why I'm telling you, friends, I can't separate teaching you the truth about prophecy from Jesus because Jesus said, I am the truth. So how can you separate the two? If for you to know the truth about the Bible and prophecy, you've got to know Jesus. He revealed the truth in his word, and that's why it survives so long. It's not like any other book. Will this changed life really be happier than the pleasures of the old life? Infinitely. For one thing, you've got a future, and that gives you hope. Hey, friends, I've been, I've been to the old world. I've been to the drugs and the drinking and the immorality and just the, I mean, just, I was exhibit A of living for the pleasures of the world. There's very little you could tell me about I didn't know about. Grew up, right, used to play 42nd Street in New York City as a kid. And you know what? There's nothing there, nothing to go back to. Let me put it to you this way, real quick. If I were to tell you, how would you like a Swiss bank account with a billion dollars in it and to be able to go to Las Vegas and do whatever you want to do, enjoy all the pleasures of the world, all the entertainment that you can afford? Don't answer me, but some of you are probably thinking, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Buy the best car. You could probably afford the best boyfriend or girlfriend. Best food, you can have the best of everything. Live like a king, penthouse suite. But there's fine print in this agreement. After 30 days, you die. You're going to be executed. Or, I tell you, you got to go to the hospital, and the doctor has to perform a painful surgery without anesthetic that's going to take 30 minutes. But when he's done with the surgery, you're going to live forever with a new body, and you'll never be sick again. You'll never have pain again. Okay, you got two options. Who would want to go have surgery without anesthetic? <laughs> but you know what I think? I'd rather do that knowing that then I've got eternal life in heaven than go to Vegas for 30 days and know every time I roll the dice or pull the slot machine, I'm just one more second to execution. You all really have one of those two choices. You can say, I want to enjoy the temporary pleasures of the world. You know, that's not even a good illustration. You know why? Because since becoming a Christian, I'm enjoying this life a lot better too. It's infinitely better for a Christian even here and now. I have a lot more fun now and I don't have a hangover. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a lot better being a Christian. Don't have the withdrawal from the drugs and the embarrassment and the, and the shame. Much better, even in this life. Christ said, I came to give you life more abundantly. But can I make myself do all the things a Christian can do? How can I manage this? On your own, you can't. Without God's help, Jesus said, without me, how much can you do? You can't do anything without Jesus. But there's another verse. It says in Philippians 4.13, I can do how many things? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Things I once thought I'd never be able to do. With God's help, you're able to do all things. You're able to be a new creature and live a new kind of life. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's, it's an ongoing process being a Christian. When you first come to him, in some senses, it's like you're born again. You're like a baby and you can learn to walk and you may fall. Don't get discouraged. You get back up again. And the Lord takes your hand and he strengthens you and he teaches you and it gets better and better and more and more joyful and more and more abundant and you are moving towards the promised land, not towards the slavery of Egypt. It's hard to obey God. You ever thought that before? Yeah, sometimes it is. You know why? The devil doesn't want you to. He wants to use you to say, see, they don't love you, they can't obey you. That's why he tempts you to disobey. Yes, you can. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. For this is the love of God, it tells us in 1 John 5, 3, that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not a burden. When you love Him, you fall in love with Jesus, it's a delight. 
That's why Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus surrendered to the Father whatever he wanted because he loved the Father. And when we love the Lord that way, we'll feel the same way. How can I be sure that keeping the commandments doesn't become legalism for me? How do I know that I'm not just doing it for the wrong reasons? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's because we have the faith of Jesus, the same kind of faith that he had, the same kind of love he had, doing it not to be saved, but because we are saved. See, God saved the children of Israel first. After he saved them, he brought them to Mount Sinai and said, here's my law. God doesn't say in Egypt, here's my law. You keep it and I'll get you out of here. He saves us just like we are. So don't be thinking, Lord, I'd like to come to you, but first I've got to straighten out my life and then I'll accept you. No, you can't do that. You've got to accept him just like you are. And then he helps you change. How can I be certain that my faith and love for Jesus will increase. When you come to the Lord the way you are, you want your faith to grow. Answer, search the scriptures. You know, if you're learning anything during this seminar, it's not Pastor Doug. I'm just sharing with you what I've learned in the Bible. We've got scripture, a lot of scripture every night. Am I right? We want you to keep studying the Bible because that's how your faith will grow. Search the scriptures. Pray. Three principal things. Read your Bible, the bread of life. You breathe, if a baby wants to grow, it eats, Bible, it breathes, and it exercises. Share your faith. Tell others about it. Use what you're learning, and you will grow. There's just no question about it. It's a natural law. Tell others what great things God has done for you. As I said, sharing your faith. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. You then walk in that newness of life that He's given you. This is... The good news of the gospel, friends. You know, Christ has offered to cleanse us from our sins. He's offered a blood transfusion to the whole world. I heard a fascinating story in a book. A doctor related that there was this family that had two children, and they both had a, a type of leukemia, which is basically a blood cancer, blood disease. And the little boy had recovered it turns out his little sister had the same blood type. And so the doctor said, you know, to the parents, he said, this is your decision. But we also need to ask little Billy. But um, he has the same blood type. He is the best candidate to avoid rejection of a transfusion that your little daughter might be healed. So the doctor said to little Billy, he said, you know, Sally's sick. And if you want Sally to, to live... We're going to need special blood, and you have that blood. Billy, would you be willing to give your blood to Sally? A oh, little Billy, he, he looked at the doctor, and his lips started to quiver a bit. And then he looked at his sister, and he said, yeah, I'll do it. So they set it up, and they arranged a transfusion. And as, you know, the boy winced a little bit when the needle was put in his arm. And, and uh, he looked at his sister again, and he smiled at her. And then he watched as the blood was running out of his arm into the container. And pretty soon he looked up to the doctor and he said, uh, how long will it take me to die? And then the doctor realized that when he asked little Billy to give his blood to his sister, he thought he was going to take all his blood. And the little boy was willing to do it that his sister might live. Think about that just selfless love. Does Jesus love you less? He has poured out his life that you might be saved. In our series on Jesus through the Bible, we're doing a flyover. And we're just looking at some of the high points because I want you to realize how much of Jesus is really in the Bible and what a sacred document you have in your hands with the Bible. It is a supernatural book that proves the reality of God. And one way we know that is because Christ was the fulfillment of all of these historical characters. And this series on Jesus throughout the Scripture, when we look at these characters in the Bible, it helps us to recognize 
Wow, how did God know? How could God have such complete control of history so that the lives of these great Bible characters that really did live could be replicated in the life of Jesus? Now this is doubly important today because of all the characters mentioned in the holy writings you find this name mentioned more than any name. David is mentioned more than our Lord Jesus. David is mentioned more than Moses, more than Elijah, more than Joseph. There's more than one John in the Bible. There's actually more than one Moses. There's more than one Jesus mentioned in the Bible. But there's only one individual in the whole Bible called by the name David. David is found 1,066 times in the Bible. There's more said about him than any other Bible character. In many ways this book could be the story of David. Jesus is the son of David. Did you know that the last chapter in the Bible talks about David? You can read there in Revelation where Christ is the root and the offspring of David in Revelation chapter 22. So let's look at some of the parallels that we're going to find in the Bi Bible about David. David means beloved. Jesus is the beloved son of the Father, called sometimes the only begotten son. You remember when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They were both anointed. Both David and Jesus were anointed. The word Christ, Christos, means anointed in Greek. Messiah means anointed in Hebrew. David was anointed. That's when he first appears he's anointed by Samuel. And he was the youngest of the brethren that were anointed. Samuel was hesitant at first. You remember John the Baptist when he baptized Jesus he said, no, you need to baptize me. But uh, he said, let it be so for now. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came on David from that day forward. David begins his ministry after his anointing. When does Christ begin his ministry? At his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down upon him. And then he begins to teach and to preach. And then, of course, there's that great story of David, and I wish I could spend more time on this, where David sees Goliath down there, who for 40 days comes out in the wilderness and defies the armies of God. After the anointing of Jesus, does he go out into the wilderness for 40 days? Does he have a battle with the devil, biggest giant of all, the giant of evil? And what is it that Jesus uses to bring down the giant? A stone. The Word of God is the rock. That's the rock that brings down that image in Daniel chapter 2. Christ is the Word. Are we right? Are we all on the same page? The Word is a rock. The Ten Commandments are written on stone. And that's what's used to bring down the giant. And so he has this battle with the giant. Jesus meets every temptation and he says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord God, and him only shall you serve. 1 Samuel 17, 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. So he was initially knocked out with a rock. He's unconscious. But he dispatches him permanently with his own sword. What is the sword biblically? The Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 6, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So stone is the Word of God, sword is the Word of God, David defeats the giant with the Word of God. How do we defeat the giant, the devil? A mighty fortress is our God. You sung that song. One little word will fell him. The Word of God Amen. brings him down. Isn't it interesting? He takes Goliath's own sword to destroy him. 
the cross that the devil used to kill Jesus is the weapon that destroys the devil. How do you and I enjoy the victory of Christ over the devil? When we see, just like the Israelites saw, that Jesus did win, he defeated the devil. Christ rose. He said, It is finished. He said, All hail. He's won. The devil's doom is sealed. But even though Goliath was dead, were the soldiers, the Philistines, still on the hill? We claim that victory, and then we need to take up the battle with David. David then led them against the Philistines. And so we join him in that battle. So this is a wonderful analogy where Christ is a type of David, or David is a type of Christ. And you say, the victory of David became the victory of the Israelites. The victory of Christ becomes our victory. And we can say, praise the Lord, we won. And then you follow your captain into battle. You don't just stand there. When Jesus overcame, we become overcomers. David stripped the enemy of his armor. 1 Samuel 17, verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus stripped the armor from the devil. Luke 11, verse 20, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace and his goods, they're at peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. This is what David did with Goliath. This is what Jesus did with the devil. You and I were captives of the devil. He liberates us. He takes away the devil's armor. Before Christ came, man has no power to resist the devil. But there's a crack in the devil's armor because of Christ. You remember when the arrow found the crack in Ahab's armor? It was the prophecy of Micaiah, the Word of God. That's what found the crack in the armor. Jesus takes away the devil's armor. He is defenseless. You and I can have a victory over him. 1 Kings 14.8. Did David sin? Did David, I mean, you know, it tells about David and Bathsheba tells about David bringing the ark up inappropriately and someone died because of that. tells about David numbering Israel. David made mistakes. Probably several. He lied and pretended he was crazy. He's drooling on his beard and foaming at the mouth and acting crazy. He wasn't crazy. Crazy like a fox as they say. And so David had his problems. But listen how God looks at David. 1 Kings 14, 8. And yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. Had God forgiven all of David's sins because of his, his sacrifice? And he looked upon David. He says, I only see that David did good because David ended well. You may fall along the way in the race and you may even have a bad start, but you want to have a good finish. And so God looked upon David and the record that God gives about David, he says, he followed me with all his heart. The reason that God could say David was a king after my heart is because David had a sacrificial love. David is a wonderful type of Jesus in the Bible. How often do you find somebody with such a complex character who in one vignette you see David, he's on a hill there with his sheep, he's strumming his harp and he's being poetic and melancholy. And next you see him, he's on the battlefield, he's got this oversized sword, and he's hacking off a giant's head. Those pictures don't usually go together in our minds about the same person doing those things, right? David is a very complex character in that he was a poet, he was a shepherd, he's a king, he's a judge, he's a builder, he's an administrator, he's a dreamer, he was a romantic. I mean, all of that David, very complex, but they're all giving different sides of our Jesus the son of David. You know, I think this is beautiful that he was willing to die for his children. Now, here's the part that I don't want you to miss. David left Jerusalem because there was a rebellion. And when this battle of Armageddon is fought, so to speak, David then comes back as king. He was a king that was basically rejected, but a king that comes back. Is our King David coming back? Our King Jesus coming back? 
the son of David. And when he came back, he rewarded those who had supported him when he was rejected. There are some who stayed behind in Jerusalem when David fled because he was rejected. When the, when the nation was kidnapped, some stayed behind that remained loyal to him. They were the minority. And some who turned on him when it was convenient, when he came back, he rewarded those who were loyal. He judged those who had been unfaithful. Our son of David is coming back and uh, he's going to bring the new Jerusalem when he comes. You know, friends, as I go through these stories, I keep thinking about that verse in Hebrews 32. As we look at the types of Jesus through all the Bible, I keep wanting to say, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the prophets. These are all types of Christ in the Bible. You know, you get all these different pictures of what Christ is like because He's reflected. I can see what you look like directly or I can look at a mirror and see what you look like. And you are seeing mirrors of Jesus all through the Bible. And so that's why we're spending time on this theme so we might know more about Him because if you know Him better, you'll love Him better. If you love Him better, you'll serve Him better. Amen? Amen. Christ is all in all in the Bible. Stay tuned. There's more Amazing Facts Presents right after this. Deep within the pages of the Bible, stories of great heroes, heroes of great deeds, great love, and great sacrifice. But behind them is another hero, hidden in plain sight amid the shadows. He was there from the beginning, and he'll be there until the end. Discover the golden thread of a savior woven throughout the entire Bible tapestry. Shadows of Light, Seeing Jesus in All the Bible, a new book by Doug Batchelor. For a donation of $20 or more, you can receive this exciting new book by Pastor Doug Batchelor. Call us today at 1-800-891-7171 or go to shadowsoflight.org. Christ is called the Word. The Bible's called the Word. Christ is called the Bread of Life. The Bible's called the Bread of Life. Christ is called the Rock. The Bible is called the Rock. Christ is called Good and Wonderful. The Word is called Good and Wonderful. As you go through the different definitions and words used to describe the Bible in the Bible, you find they're almost always also used to describe Jesus. So it shouldn't surprise you that all through the Bible you find Jesus. Today we're going to look at the book of Job and we'll understand something about the sufferings of Christ. We're really going to be on holy ground today. All through the book of Job you can find allegories and references to Jesus. Not only uh, the book of Job, but the whole Old Testament really mirrors the life of Christ. It's different facets of the life of Jesus. Like a diamond, you turn it to the light and you see different facets and cuts in the diamond glimmering. As you look through the Old Testament you see Jesus everywhere and the book of Job is no exception. One very easy thing to discern how Job is like Jesus is in the first chapter, the first line. There was, Job is perfect and upright it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and he hated evil. In the very beginning, the Bible extols almost the sinlessness of Job. Now I'm not saying Job was sinless because he was a man and the Bible says all have sinned. But he was a righteous man and a godly man. Christ was sinless. 1 Peter 2, 22. That's easy to remember, 1 Peter 2, 2, 2. It says, Christ who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Again, in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 22. Very much like 1 Peter. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Job is called a servant of God. Jesus is identified as the servant. Job 2, verse 3. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a blameless and an upright man. Speaking of Christ, Isaiah prophesies, Isaiah 42 verse 1, 
Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now you realize that with a type and with an anti-type that the, uh, the anti-type is usually, it's a shadow. It's not an exact replica, but there's great similarities there. And this is where as you read through the book of Job, you keep seeing the shadows in the types of Christ that are there. For instance, he's forsaken by his friends. His friends come from far. At first they're coming to support him. But ultimately as the story goes on, they turn on him. They say, well, you're getting what you deserve. Was Jesus forsaken by his friends? Matthew 26, 56, But all this was done that the scriptures and the prophets might be fulfilled. All the disciples forsook him and fled. Job says, chapter 19, verse 14, My relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. By the way, after Job's suffering and he's out there in the dump, his wife comes along and says, why don't you just curse God and die? All of his family dies except his wife. The devil saved her so she could come and say, why don't you just die? Sometimes the devil will even use those closest to us to discourage us. It doesn't mean they're bad, but you know that even the devil used Peter on Jesus. He's falsely accused of evil. Job is. Job was a perfect and upright man, but what did they say about him? Job 22 verse 5. His friend said, Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? Well, that was opposite the testimony of God. Was Jesus falsely accused of evil? Matthew 26, verse 59. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought fought false testimony against him. False testimony. To put Jesus to death, but they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. At last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple and to build it in three days. And they said when he was hanging on the cross, the reason you're suffering is because of your wickedness. God's abandoned you. Remember, as we look at the sufferings of Christ and Job, Christians also suffer when you follow Jesus. We also experience persecution. There will be dark days where you'll be tested God will withdraw that hedge and you'll wonder, what have I done? Why is this happening to me? I've gone to visit people in the hospital. I remember word for word, that's what they said. Doug, why is God doing this to me? They feel like they're abandoned. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love you. He still loved Job. The father still loved his own son and they suffered. And you know what else I love about the comparison between Job and Jesus? Is as you near the end of the book, there are times when Job's faith, faith is vacillating. And you can say he's saying, why, why, why? And Jesus said, why? Why have you forsaken me? But it triumphs. Then you read those verses where he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So no matter what happens, Christ on the cross at the end, he triumphs. He ends up saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. He knew that his mission was complete. There was a great triumph there. In the beginning of the book of Job, Job doesn't know what's going on. All of a sudden he gets blindsided by all these plagues and losing his family and losing his wealth and his health. And he's saying, why has God done this to me? By the end of the book, God is showing him now who's really behind it. In Job chapter 41, God dedicates an entire chapter to some sea monster called Leviathan. Now listen, here's the key. Isaiah 27 verse 1. In that day the Lord with His sore and great and strong sword, that's the Word of God, shall punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Oh, aha, you ought to have an epiphany right about now. Does that sound familiar to you? Revelation chapter 12, speaking of that dragon, another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery dragon. It says in chapter 13 verse 1, this beast with seven heads and seven horns comes up out of the sea. And it says that dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, Satan, dragon, serpent, Leviathan, out of the sea. Who are we talking about? So in the end of the book, 
What is, is God saying? Now there may have been some sea creature that's now extinct. Scholars don't agree. Some say it's a crocodile, but they say it couldn't have been a crocodile. It's in the ocean. Well, there are, there are saltwater crocodiles, but they weren't that big. And believe me, sailors have plenty of stories and theories about what that is. But he's basically saying, you can't defeat the Leviathan without me. He's the one who's behind your sufferings. He's the one who brought fire down from heaven and burnt up your, your crops, who was able to send this sickness, who destroyed your family with a tornado. You can't defeat the devil. But God says, I can. And so in the end of the book of Job, God is saying that I am the one who can destroy the Leviathan, the king of pride. And Job is going, He's, it's not you God who's been against me. It's the Leviathan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent who's been after me. And you simply let his leash get a little longer so that I could learn something. Learn to trust you. You know what's also beautiful about the book of Job? Is that uh, it teaches us lessons of hanging on and patience. In the end, Job is blessed. He's doubly blessed in the end. Matter of fact, Job kind of goes through a resurrection, don't you think? He goes from being in the dump covered with boils, dying, it looks terminal, all of a sudden God heals him miraculously, he's interceding for his friends, he restores all of his wealth, he's got twice as much wealth, you look at what he has, add up what he's got in the beginning, then you add up what he has at the end, it's doubled. And he lives another 140 years beyond that experience. We don't know how old he was, you can just speculate he was at least for him to be, have those kids that he had and have the wealth he had based on that time in which he lived, he lived over 200 years. And so it was like a type of resurrection he went through, just like Jesus. And his glory returned to him as Christ when he ascended to heaven. His health returned to him. His friends returned to him. Everything came back. And you may go through trials, but you know the book of Job ends with a happy note. That's why James says, remember the patience of Job. Don't get discouraged if you're going through a trial, friends. God still loves you. There's a devil out there, and he's going to try and cause problems. But when you look at the scope of Job's life, 200 years. And then the 42 chapters, how long did it last out of that 200 years? A few weeks. A few weeks of suffering for the 200 years. So the suffering that we experience in this life and the episodes of suffering in this life compared to eternity, what is it? Is it worthy to be compared? It's small compared to the glory and the joy and the happiness and the blessing and the riches that God is going to give us for eternity. So the book of Job is not a sad book. Oh, there's a lot of heavy things in there, but you know it starts out talking about a perfect man and it ends up talking about a happy, blessed man. And then it says that in between you've got God's blessing and protection, the devil makes an attack. Job does not give up his faith and then in the end he's blessed forever. You and I are going to get attacked. You might be going through an attack right now. Don't give up your faith. Remember where I started out with that quote from James? Behold, we count them happy which endure. Jesus said, blessed are those who endure to the end. They will be saved. He that endures to the end shall be saved. You've heard of the patience of Job and has seen the end of the Lord, though the Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy. In the end, friends, we win, not the Leviathan or the dragon. Can you see Jesus in the book of Job? You know, it's, it really is holy ground. It tells you something about how much Jesus must love you because of the sufferings he went through. And Job did not suffer like Jesus. He suffered. And you may suffer. You might be suffering now. But you and I haven't suffered like Jesus suffered. He took the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders for you and me because he loves us so much because he doesn't want us to suffer like that. And I think you could trust a God like that, don't you friends? Don't be discouraged. Hang on like Job and you'll come forth on the other side. God will speak to you face to face like he talked to Job face to face. Your character will be purified and you will be like Christ. Amen?